Thank you, young man, for helping out last week. That was an awesome message. I've really been worrying as to what the uh, Lord's wanting to say. And I think this is where we're headed. I want to talk to you a little bit First of all, just how you stay out from under the law. Second of all, how to stop demon activity in your life. You know, I used to think that it's just my flesh. My flesh is sinning and my flesh is doing wrong. And the more I read the Word and the more I'm into what the Word has to say, the more I realize it's not really my flesh, although we have a sin nature before we're, before we're born again. But we still fight it after we're born again, don't we? And so I looked at it and I said, Lord, I don't understand it. But you know, I never really knew about demon activity. You kind of like touched on it, you know, and, and most pastors are scared to talk about it or they're ignorant. I mean, I don't know. And I, they don't want to get into the offending people and, and these kind of things. But demonic activity is a spiritual world. And all that we do here is dictated by the spiritual world. You either surrender to God or you surrender to the enemy of God. Yeah, your flesh has its things going on. But you see, you've got to understand the enemy knows about your flesh. And so there are demons at every level. And these demons are constantly working you from the flesh level. He's not a, he's not a, a spirit in a sense, like the Holy Spirit. He is a demon. And the devil is a fallen angel. And the Spirit of God is different. These demonic forces are allowed to exist for a season. I don't know why you'd think that God would have tried to take them out a long time ago. But I mean, I read through the Old Testament and it's like, God, why didn't you mess this? Why didn't you stop that whole mess? He dealt with it for 4,000 years. Now, you know how long that is? Before Jesus came, 4,000 years. Sounds like God's pretty patient. It says, let patience have its perfect work, right? You think God's any different? Do you think he doesn't operate according to his word? He asked you to do it. Why? So he can put condemnation on you, or you can put condemnation on yourself, or, you, or somebody else can put condemnation on you from what they say. Or you're weak, they, they speak against you and your weakness or they condemn you some way. No. God wants you to be in his word because he knows if you act like him, you can't fail. And can't act like him unless you know how he acts. And it's not about logos, which is the written word. That's what this is. This is the written word. It's not about this. It's about rhema, the revelation word, the word logos that speaks to your heart and it becomes real. It takes on life. 
there's life in the Logos, that's where the rhema comes from, the Logos. But God wrote it, and we know from history, man doesn't learn, does he? Does man learn? People say, well, you know, we got to have history because we learn from our mistakes. Do you know anybody that's ever done that? You ever known any nation that's done that? You th we're more educated now in this country than ever before. Do you think we don't know about history, about the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, the, the Nebuchadnezzar and his dudes? Do you think we don't know about all that? But we don't learn. Now we're getting to a place. I just, I was listening to a, a radio program as I was walking through my bathroom this morning, and, and they said that... Uh, The city of Fargo, North Dakota, has decided they're not going to pledge allegiance to the flag anymore because it's got God in it. And that's, and that's a God of Jesus and Abraham and them. But the, how about all the gods of the Hindu God and the, the Arab God and all the other gods? We can't offend these people. It's like, does anybody realize or remember what this country was formed from, why it was formed, what was its purpose? Have, have, we, have, we, missed, have we missed our way? Fargo, North Dakota is a very conservative marketplace. North Dakota has been Republican forever. South Dakota, all those uh, perimeter states. I mean, pretty much the middle of the country is pretty conservative. I mean, you got to go all the way to the borders to get really a little radical, except down in Florida. But we know, as in Joshua, chapter 1, 8, 9, we know in Deuteronomy 28, 1 and 2, we know in Romans where it talks about faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. See, what's happening is you hear the word, the word gets inside of you and it starts working. And if you open yourself up to it, it'll start becoming a part of you. And as it becomes a part of you, you'll, st you'll start talking like God, you start thinking like God, and you start acting like God, and then things start changing. But you got to stick with it. You can't pussyfoot with it. You can't play with it a little here and play with it a little there. And if it don't work, well, why in the world don't it work for me? I laid hands on that guy and he didn't get healed. What well, says to lay hands on the sick and they'll get healed or they'll be, they will be healed. Well, you know what? First time you ride a bicycle, how'd you do? First time you shot a basketball, how'd you do? How about shoot, hitting a golf ball? How about throwing a football? How about running? How did you do? Everything in the kingdom is that way. Little by little. Line upon line. Precept upon precept. I know you made some bad business decisions. So what? Who cares? Nobody cares. And you shouldn't. You pick yourself up and you go back at it again. Whatever you've dealt with in your life, whatever seems to have been a failure, whatever you look at in your life when you look in that mirror and you say, you have some weaknesses and you can't overcome them. If you think it's going to be about you overcoming your weaknesses after you've been born again, you'll never get there. You can't do it yourself. Do you understand? You have a temper and you get angry, it's going to make you sick if you don't discipline it and you don't get it under control. But it's not about you doing it because if you try and do it, it'll work temporarily for about 13 seconds. You've got to know what God has to say about it because that's where you get your faith, your confidence. And it takes faith. You don't have faith in yourself. You know, those guys that have faith in their self, what do you call them? Arrogant. Cocky. 
You know what happens to those people? They go down. Just a matter of time. You know what's amazing to me is like guys like Tom Brady and, and Aaron, uh, who's a football guy, Rogers, some of those guys, how they've been able to maintain their greatness. Do you know how they have? They're, you ought to listen to them talk. They're very humble. Maybe they, were, maybe they had that benefit when they were young. Maybe the parents taught them how to do that. And if the father was doing his job, he should have done that. You've got to, you've got to, don't get cocky, don't get overconfident, and just go out there. You work hard, you go at it, and then you go into your game and you, and you work your game like you work your practice. That's, what, that's exactly the same principle of the word. When you're reading that Bible, you're practicing. Do you understand? That's all you're doing. You're practicing. And you're not going to do anything else till at some point in time something challenges you. And then you better be ready for the game. Do you see how people fail? They don't practice. They don't get ready. Why is it that everything in the world out here is like that? But when it comes to the Bible, I, I, I don't know what it is. It, it, it's, it's such a gray area and so, so mystical. And, and I guess everybody gets to a point because they've never been taught properly that they just say, oh, you know what? You, you know the old Calvin theory? God's in control of everything. And if God wants to do it, then he'll do it. I've had people look me in the eye and say, you know, if God wants me healed, he'll do it. I said, well, why don't you stand and believe? Do you have any scriptures you believe it for? Well, no, just God... God's in control of my life. I made him the Lord. Whatever happens, happens. Que sera, sera. That's a great deception. And that's a Calvinistic theory that has been preached in Bible colleges around this country for hundreds of years. God's dominant, God's superior, God's sovereign. And he's just going to do whatever he wants to do whenever he wants to do it. But the problem is, is they got something going on in their life that's a violation of the word of God, but they're saying God's doing it. How does that work? When Jesus says, I wish that none should perish, why are people perishing? Because if God, if God wants me to be born again, he'll, just, he'll, he'll do it. He doesn't want anybody to do that. He doesn't want anybody to perish. He doesn't want anybody to be sick. Jesus went around doing good and healing all those who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Does that sound like he wants everybody sick? Well, he did it, but we can't have it. That's not the purpose of him coming to the earth. Listen, the purpose for him coming to the earth was not taking you to heaven. That was not his purpose. That would be like saying, I'm going to go buy a car and you go buy four tires. Well, that ain't a car. What do you mean it ain't a car? I went and bought four tires. What are you telling me it's not a car? Right out there they are, four tires. Even when looking for a steering wheel. Maybe an engine. You still ain't got a car. Salvation is more than getting born again. It's all inclusive. It's everything. Everything in your life that kills, steals, and destroys. Everything in your life that prevents you from being successful and prospering and being blessed and being healthy. Everything that comes at you that wants to take you down or push you out or not give you or take away your needs or take away any any kind of uh, uh, financial benefit, anything that wants to take all that away, those things are not from God. But I hear it all the time. It's like. I don't get it, man. The more I read this, the more I know, the more I know, the more I, I try and work it in my life. And yet I hear all this stuff going on. It's like, where do you guys get that? No wonder I was ignorant when I was 25 years old. I didn't know who I was, where I was, and what I was doing there. And 
And I went to the Catholics, and I went to the, the Lutherans, and I went to the Methodists, and I went to the Presbyterians and the Baptists, and I went to the Jews. I went to everybody, and I couldn't figure, I couldn't get anybody to tell me anything more than what I knew, and I didn't, I didn't know nothing. They couldn't explain to me what the gifts of the Spirit were. Well, you know, that's something they did back then. That's the basic synopsis. That's been done away with. Well, I didn't know what the gifts of the Spirit did. I had one of my ex-employees come to me and told me I was of the devil because I believed in it. I said, well, I don't, even, I don't even speak in tongues, but I've made a decision, you know, a few months ago, I'm going to believe everything in the Bible. Well, that's of the devil. My pastor told me that. I, he told me that three times. And on the third time, he said, you know what? I ain't going back to that pastor. I don't think he knows what he's doing. Because all I did was say, I don't know nothing about the tongues. I've never done it. I've never... All I know is it's in the book. And I made a decision that I'm going to believe what's in the book. And then when I read it, that's what I'm going to believe. Because nobody else can tell me the truth. I couldn't find anybody. So I just decided, okay. And that was the first time God appeared to me in my life. It was 1978. He appeared to me in light. And I did, never thought of it that way. I never thought of him appearing to me. Just never thought of that issue. But one day he spoke to me and he said, son, I appeared to you. I said, well, what do you mean he appeared to me? I didn't see you. He said, did you see that light? I said, yeah, but that wasn't you. He said, that wasn't me. What does the Bible say? God is light. You guys ever read the book of John? So I realized he appeared to me. I'm not going to get to see what he looks like anyways. Nobody has. Nobody ever, ever will until you're out of here. So I figure that's a good place to start. Jesus appeared to me once, too. Didn't really think of it that way. But I'm saying, God spoke to me, and he said, you have no need of any man to teach you, but the anointing that abides in you, son, will teach you everything you need to know. And that was the end of it. I said, it's done. He set me free. Because up to that point, I thought I was losing my life. I was getting depressed. I was getting discouraged. I was getting defeated. I was getting to a point, and it don't sound like it now to you guys, I'm sure, but you had to know where my heart was then. I had no hope. I had no idea what I was doing. And I'd been to Bible school. I'd, I'd been saved since I was 12, and I'm in a place at 25 years old, and I don't know who I am, what I am, and what I'm doing there. And when he appeared to me, in a dark room in, in a little house I just built for me and my family, bam, he spoke to me. He shined right on that scripture. I didn't, I didn't ask for it, didn't try it, didn't think about it. Bam. I never heard of such a thing. I couldn't even tell anybody about it for a long time. Not until I got pretty bold and cocky about it, you know. I got confident, not cocky. I got to get understanding what this word is, and I began to see other miracles happen, and then I began to develop my confidence in the word. See, Mark, Mark gave a story, I think it was last week maybe, but recently, where, you know, he had a pain, and he realized that wasn't his pain. And then all of a sudden, he opened his eyes to it, and he realized it wasn't his pain. The Holy Spirit was working through him. It's nothing mystical or magical. It's nothing ooh or funny bone. It's just, it's just gifting that God has given every single one of you guys. And you are hearing the truth from this place right here. And you guys need to start looking for something that God wants you to do. Doesn't matter your age. Doesn't matter your youth. He wants you to be busy doing something. He wants you, as you walk.
your day, whether you're pouring concrete or, or, or running jobs or building buildings, whatever it is, when you go through your day, God will fit it in. You'll never lose a thing. Matter of fact, you'll gain. Be ready to use these gifts that I'm talking to you guys about and I'm teaching you. Be open to the Holy Spirit. Be sensitive to, what, Lord, what are you doing here? What can I do here? How can I help? You know, always be sensitive to what the Holy Spirit is saying. Always be ready and willing and able to reach out. That's revelation. That's when he begins to talk to you from what you've been spending your time practicing. But you can't do it if you don't listen and train. Training and listening, that's what goes on. And yes, you know what? When you guys played sports, and probably many of you were involved somewhere along the line, you know a lot of the time that you spent dinking around didn't seem like it was amounting to much. Is that right? You went, or you went in the military, and a lot of your basic training seemed like it was just a bunch of joke. It just didn't seem like it was mine much. But see, you weren't wise enough. You weren't living in the realm that the trainers were doing. Yeah, maybe your high school coaches or college coaches weren't that good. Maybe, maybe your, maybe your, your uh, military trainers weren't that good. I don't know. But they knew more than you did. That you can take to the bank. But a lot of that time seemed like it was wasted. Doesn't it feel like that when you read the Bible? It seemed like you sat down and read for an hour or two hours. and it just, Or you know what? I pray in tongues for hours. I don't ever feel nothing. I don't feel nothing. I probably prayed in the spirit 100,000 hours. In my life. And I can't tell you one single time I ever felt anything. Because the Holy Spirit doesn't work with your flesh. And that's where you feel. You don't feel in the spirit. You feel in your flesh. That's why you shouldn't never have confidence in your flesh. But that's where most people have it. Look what I did. I got this degree. I, was, I, I got this grade. And I'm smart. And you know, everything's about the flesh. And the, and the soul, the mind. The spirit doesn't have nerves. The spirit doesn't have brains. It has a mind. But it's different than your brain. You get stuff out of here and you memorize it and you hide it in your heart. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not Sin against you. So you hide it in there and you leave it in there and you just go on and you have no feelings. But it's in the mind of the spirit. When you memorize the word, it goes into the mind of the spirit. Yeah, it's in your brain too. But your brain's going to say, nah, that don't make sense. But if it's in the mind of the spirit, if it's in your spirit, you don't need to have Confirmation. You don't need to have feelings. You do it by faith. That's how it works. The power is in faith, not in understanding. Do you understand? He's told you to don't tr trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean to your understanding. Because it's going to lead you astray because your brain and your body doesn't make sense when you read this thing. If your body is in pain and it's hurting or you got some sickness or some disease, your body don't give a rip about what that thing says. I just don't want to feel this way. I got this pain and I don't want it. But it's that book and faith that drives that out. If not, you got to go to get your drugs, you got to go to the hospital, you got to go to your doctor, you got to get all this crap, you got to yada, 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 and spend all that money. Is that all kill, steal, and destroy? Huh? 
What happened to the lady with the issue of blood? She walked up. She's tired of this mess, 13 years. She said, if I just touch the hem of this garment, that's the end of it. But what's the key point there? What? She determined in her heart. She didn't touch it. She never heard about touching anybody's cloth. She never, you, where did she hear that about? She didn't know about that. Where'd she come up with that? What is this, woman a dingbat or what? Where'd she come up with that? You know what her friends would tell her? You're out of your mind, woman. You got to live with this and you probably won't live very long. 13 years of this, there ain't no hope for you. Do you think that's what her friends were saying? Let me tell you something. You start getting into this book and start believing this word, there's going to be a lot of friends that are just going to go right on by. If you're keeping all your old friends, you ain't doing nothing. Not unless they're coming along with you, which chances are pretty great that they're not. You have to know in your heart that this book is real. But you've got to hide it in your heart first because it doesn't do any good in paper and ink. Paper and ink doesn't do anything. It doesn't come to life until you get it in your spirit, in your heart. And your mind knows what the heart's saying so that they're in agreement. Because once those two get in agreement, your mind says, I'm going to do something, your body will do it. If not, your body's going to dictate to the mind. I don't feel like it. It don't look like it. I got sickness. I don't see how. My checkbook is empty. That's what your body's going to say, and your mind's going along with it. Because your mind is that battleground. Okay, you've got to make sure that word is getting in your mind because the word is the only thing that can push the mind over to the other side. And it'll make your body go do it. It'll make your body think. Just like, just like when Mark laid hands on that guy. His body in the natural didn't want to do it, but he knew in the spirit, and it convinced the mind, and he made the body go do it. You know what your body wants to do? Wants to eat. Wants to sleep. Wants to sit on the couch. It's just not part of anything I've ever done. Unless I'm praying. I've had people tell me, don't you ever slow down? I said, it's not my, it's not my nature. You know why? Because I've made my mind renewed. Renew your mind and prove that which is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I've renewed my mind to the place where my mind is not allowed to do that. So it has to make the body do things. And I'll do this, and I'll do that, and I'll go here and go there, and I'll start new projects. You know, I'm, I'm in a time when the world says, man, you ought to be kicking back and taking it easy. Well, just exactly what do you want me to do? How much sitting around do you think is good for you? Can you show me what the world even has to say about it? They will even tell you. You read anything about conditioning and taking care of yourself. Does any of that talk about sitting around doing nothing? And yet that's where the church finds itself. That's why we got to break out of this. That's why we got to demonstrate to those out there in the world that God has put us in. This, you're here. Because God's put you here. This is not a coincidence. You're here at this time, in this place, at this moment, for God says you have something I want to get done. But he can't get it done if you don't get your mind renewed to who he is, what he says, what he wants you to do. Because if you don't have your mind renewed, that's reading this book, studying it, meditating on it, and letting it get in your mind and change it. Then it's in a position where it can force the body to do what God speaks to you. 
If not, you'll blow it off as a hunch all the time. And who do you reckon that is talking to you? Demons. And I become real, I have become thoroughly convinced. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. This is what got me started on this pathway. It says, finally, brothers, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. How are you going to use his might? Do you know what it is? Is it electricity? <laughs> now you're energized like the stupid movies, you know. And they come up with this, some of the craziest things in the world. But you know what? In the spirit world, what they're putting on there is real. A lot of this stuff is real. Mostly demonic. I got ridiculed when I was raising my children. This is back before iPads, iPhones, i anything. Because I wouldn't let my children watch television, a lot of the movies and stuff. And I wouldn't let my children look at the computers. They even ridiculed us. But you know what? I don't give a rip. I don't care what they say. When are you going to stop letting your children run your house? That's what I'm saying. The children are running it. And then after that, the wife's running it, and the husband, he stays at home and does nothing. Stay at home, dad. Whatever. Where have we evolved? There, there's nothing in this book that talks about any of that stuff. God made a way for me and my wife because I just said this is what the word says. I'm not, there, there's, we're not going to sit around and talk about it. I'm not compromising. I'm not compromising what I believe. And when I stepped out in faith, I did the same exact thing. I said, I'm not compromising. I know it's going to look like I'm failing, and I know it's going to look like I ain't going to make it, and I know it looks like this thing's going to fail, and I know it looks like I'm doomed, but I won't care. That's what happens when you commit yourself to reading the book meditating on it, studying it, and letting it get into your heart because there's a moment in time come when you come up to a point in that road to life, you're going to get to a why, and you're going to have to say God's way or the world's way. And you spend your whole life making that decision. God has never been uh, taken a Christian and didn't give him two ways to go at the fork in the road. Never. It's just... Flesh is the easy way to go. You know why? There's no commitment, no dedication, no responsibility, no faith. Don't have to, all the money I make is in my pocket and in the bank to build my life of comfort and my life of ease and everything copacetic with me because I got all I need and me, my wife, my two kids, us four, no more. That's that fork in the road. It's called the flesh. But there's a fork in the road called the things of the spirit. And that's where the power is. It's not in the flesh. You think being a billionaire is, is, is a wonderful thing? Just ask Donald Trump. Ask a lot of them. Many of them are miserable. They had an idea come from God. They worked the idea, started working for him, started blessing him, and they, they end up, guys like Bill Gates. They said, I don't know God. And, and he's more problem in this country than he is a blessing. Trying to get rid of meat and because cows have methane gas and, and vegetable burgers and, you know, what, what, where's all that? The Bible says kill and eat.
Well, they're smarter than God. Don't you understand? They're billionaires. That's why when somebody asked me, so who do you work for? I said, I work for the richest man in the universe. Well, who's that? God. And they go, oh, yeah, right. Oh, I guess I shouldn't ask that question. They say, they don't get it. And you know what? I don't care. I just told them the truth. I figure the truth will set them free. So you know what? I don't care about anything else. I don't care about hurting your feelings. Or if worst, I just ignore you. Does the Bible say the righteous are bold as a lion? Does it say that? I said righteous. If you're not as bold as a lion, you're not righteous. At least you're not acting like it. How bad can you have it? Having something and you don't act like it. Don't use it. The devil just take you and beat the daylights out of you. That's, that's what this book says. And this, is, this, this, was, this was the center of the universe for my journey in understanding demonic world, physical world, mental world. You know, the Harvard world. You got the physical world. That's the sports athletes and all those guys. And then you got a spiritual world. And we idolize. You take these men and we idolize them. And James, what's that guy's name? LeBron James, and put him on our deck, and we carry his trophy around, the statue. We idolize them. We worship these athletic guys. I respect it. But I'd never have their name on anything I have. We, you know what? If you put Jesus on there, they get offended. But LeBron James, oh, my God. Oh, he's a billionaire. Ain't he something? Oh, he's the greatest and the great of the greatest of greats. Yeah. It's like, it means nothing to me. He, he's nothing compared to the God I serve. He's nothing. He has nothing. That's how I believe. That's how I see things. I've got this God that I'm serving, and he's the richest person. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Well, if you like cattle, start believing for a couple. That's how you do it. And it isn't long, and he starts trusting you with things. You know what? You stay faithful to him, and you don't compromise with your friends and your relatives and all the people around you and all the monkey business that's going on with the Christian church, and you just stay true to your values and true to your core. You get your butt off the couch, and you get something done and quit trying to live life of ease and laziness because that's your flesh. That's not your spirit. And he'll trust you with things. A little here, a little there. You faithful in the little things? He makes you ruler over much. But that's a process of life. That doesn't happen in 35 seconds. He tells you to give, and you just blow it off. Not a problem. And you know what? He doesn't love you any less. He loves you the same. He still loves the world. And they mock him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believes on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He's never stopped that. He loves the world. If you're a believer, you think he don't love you, you can be a biggest screw-up in the universe. And you know what? He's still going to love you. You may end up in prison. You may have nothing, and you may have poor kids, and everybody's screwed up. But you know what? He doesn't love you any less. 
God does not love you because you do something in faith. What he does is he reaches out and uses you to bless you and to be a blessing. When you learn how to do that, he begins to supersize it. He increases it. But we have to decide who is our Lord. We have to decide who we're going to follow. We have to decide what we're going to believe. We have to decide what we're going to learn. We're going to have to decide my people are destroyed for what? You don't know what that book says? You're screwed. You know who you got to fight? The demons. And they don't play fair. They take advantage of you. I listened to this one testimony. And this guy said he was watching this uh, witch, and they read tarot cards and... and uh, other things, I don't know what all they do, but tarot cards and they read your poem and they do things. And he was a spiritual man. He's watching this. He said, I just want to see this. He was on an airplane. And he saw in the spirit world. And these demons were all over this. This guy and this lady come up and wanted some advice. On the Terica, I, I need some direction. You know what? You know what happened? He watched the demon whisper in the ear of the witch. Said, "This is her name." Do you think the demons know your name? Are you kidding me? They're not brilliant. They just know. They have no barriers. So the demon spoke to the lady, the witch. The lady, the witch looks at the lady and says, your name is Jane Carr. Guess what happened when that happened? The witch had her attention, didn't she? And she's thinking. Now the demon sees there's doubt going on. That demons that follow you around, they know the reaction that you give every single time. They know the reaction, and then they deal with you accordingly. If they see a reaction of doubt, they see a reaction of lust or any other thing, they will trumpet man, they will take advantage of it. They know. So the witch says, he saw the demon leave. Within a couple of seconds, the demon came back. And he whispered to the witch, said something to her. He's watching all this. In the spirit. Because he prays in tongues a lot before he gets on planes and and all the other stuff he does. And God just revealed this to him. And this witch, you had a brother that died by getting hit by a car riding his bicycle 40 years ago. Now, do you think the lady's hooked? The lady's hooked. How did you know that? How did you know that? I want to ask you something. How fast do demons travel? They're not, listen, first of all, they're not omniscient, they're not omnipresent. They're not like God. They don't know all. 
This demon was going back to this lady's hometown, looking up the information, coming back and giving the witch that information so the witch could hook her and have her under her control. You know what she said? There's no way you could have known that. Nobody knows that. It has to be spiritual. In other words, it's got to be a God thing. Right? Most people believe that. Most, you know what? The demons don't want them, people to know about them. They don't want them to know. Why? Because they, they, they get a lot done in darkness. What's, the dark, what's dark? Your brain. Lack of knowledge. Your brain is dark. Do you understand? There's no light. The Bible says the word of God is light. When you read the word and put it in your brain, it brings light to your brain. Without it, you're dark. And they take advantage of that. They know that. They know everything that's written in here. But they can't be redeemed. They're lost forever. They were the spirits of dead people in Noah's day. They had nowhere to go. When the, those people had spirits, and when they died, the spirit had nowhere to go. That's why Jesus said to the demons, get out of her or get out of him. And they said, oh, man, don't, don't make us go into dry places and wonder. We don't like wondering, man. That's lonely. We, we, send us into the pigs. They don't care what it is. They just don't like to be lonely. They want to be in something. That's the way their nature. They want to be in your life. They want to be in everything you do. They want to have control of you. And if you're dark in your brain and you're dark in your mind, they are going to just twist you around their finger. They're going to make you sick. They're going to... Because you, they're going to get you to go listen to those negative things about COVID and negative things about this disease and that disease. And how many times you watch TV and, and, and every pill on there is my guys, it'll fix this problem, but it'll make your feet fall off and you lose your sight. And, you know, and the, the, these demons don't care, man. They want you to have that knowledge. That's the light that they want you to have in this darkness. Sickness and disease is darkness. Anything that's not from God is not light. See this light here? God created that light. Men didn't create that. Are you kidding me? God come up with that. Everything, everything out here, everything around us is, comes from God. All knowledge, all power, all th it all comes from God. But we don't acknowledge him for it. We give glory to men. We give glory to this and that. And in this case, this witch was hooking her. And you know what she said? She knew she, the witch and the demon knew they had this lady hooked. You know what she said? The way your mother died of cancer, you're going to be dead in two weeks. To see what he's doing. Do you see how the demons work? They don't want that knowledge just for health, for whatever reason. They want to carry out their thing on you. And they can't do it if you're a child of God unless you believe it, unless you receive it, unless you accept it and you allow it. You have to allow it because you have God inside of you. But if you are dark in your brain, you don't know what you have. And you won't fight nothing. That's why God told us in Ephesians chapter 6, he says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But we wrestle against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore, put on the whole armor of God. What does the helmet do? Protects your brain. You take the word and hide it in your heart. It goes to your brain. It goes to your mind. Your mind is controlling the brain. Your spiritual mind. And that darkness can't get a hold of you. Because you, you and God are working together on this thing. 
And the demons can't touch you if you simply resist the devil and he will flee. But if you don't know that, you don't believe that, you don't understand that, whatever comes to your mind, if you don't deal with it, it becomes a part of you. And just like this lady, And you know what happened? You're going to die in two weeks. So this brother was sitting over here praying in tongues. And this, this witch was getting a whole bunch of people lined up in the airplane. They all wanted to read it. They all wanted to have it. They're hearing what's going on. And they're believing it. And so this brother is praying in tongues. What else would you do? If you don't believe in tongues, you're screwed. You're done. You have no power because your brain isn't going to figure it out. You just know it's wrong. But what do you do? That's a big deal, isn't it? Isn't that big deal? Every time you make a decision in business or anything, what do you do? So he was praying in tongues. And all of a sudden, she's got all these people lining up on the plane wanting to hear what this lady has to say. Because they were hearing what was going on and they were all getting hooked. Then he puts death into the situation. Because he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. So he's putting death in the situation. But here's this brother standing over here praying in tongues. And all of a sudden this witch is sitting there going, man, I don't know what's going on. Everything's getting foggy. It gets, everything's getting confused. I don't know what's going on. I, I, I can't even talk anymore. All the passengers just went back to their seats. And then this brother walked up to the lady who was going to die in two weeks, and he said, that's a lie. That's not going to happen. You've been deceived. Do you have the power to do that? You can. You know how? It's already in you. Have you ever heard of the Holy Spirit? You ever heard? Of, you know, I don't know, what, what is he just, he's kind of like Mr. Dormant? Does it say in Genesis chapter 1? I mean, we're pretty basic here. The Spirit of the Lord moved across the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Well, who do you think created the light? Who do you think is inside of you? Well, God don't need you to be out there creating light and creating another earth. He doesn't need that but he needs you to be taking advantage and control of your life and don't allow these demons any activity. Because here's the deal. If you teach those demons, you got those problems, you got things in your life, you got things in your past that, you, that, you've, been give, that you've given into and that seem like they always are controlling you and every time you seem like you get your act together, you, you got that thing comes back and it takes advantage of you and takes control of you. What do you think? Men come here and then they go away. They get totally free. And then they go away. They don't put anything back in them. They sweep the house real good while they're here. And then when they go home, the demons come back. And they challenge you. And you know what? If you haven't done anything about it, they find the house swept and put in order. That's what the Bible says. And guess what? They have control again. And when they tell you to do something, to walk in fear, to get angry, or, or do things that are wrong, things that you know that you shouldn't do, all those weaknesses that you've had in your life, they come back. Because you didn't do something about your house.
you got to get serious about this thing. If you start a business and you're not serious about it, how long do you boys think it'll last? Because you just kind of joke with it. And so, you know, going to Florida is a good thing, but if you go there every week, not a good thing. Go home and kick your feet up and rest on the couch and think, I'll just drink a few beers and I'll just have me a good time here. Or go out and do the things that, I mean, I've seen, I've seen it over and over and over. And I talk to them, I counsel with them, and they walk away as dead in their mind as they were when they come to talk to me. You could see. They weren't any more interested in that than the man in the moon. They liked their life. They liked their lifestyle. And then, and then they went out of business. And then they fell. And then it didn't work anymore. Boom. <laughs> You got to believe that stuff. It's right here. I'm teaching you this part of it. I know now why I was worrying about what I was going to talk about tonight. I mean, I just, I've been in there praying in the spirit for hours. What am I supposed to say? I knew about some of these things, but what do I say, Lord? We know where our wrestling is. People are not your problem. You don't give them place. You don't hang with friends that laugh at you and think you're crazy. You don't do that. If they come around, you make sure you're the one doing the talking. You got it? And if they try and talk the other way, you put them in their place. No, I don't believe that. No, that's not what the Bible says. And they'll think you're crazy. And at some point in time, they won't come around anymore because they think you're crazy. I got bunches of them in my life, but I had to decide. Let God be true and every man a liar. That's what I had to decide. That was the fork in the road. Let God be true, and every man a liar, or keep going to the same old, same old, and expecting different results. You can't do the same thing over and over and over and over and over again expecting different results. You've got to start making some changes. You've got to begin to ask the Holy Spirit, what in the world that I, do I need to clean up? What do I need to change? How... What part of my life is not functioning the way it should? And most of you know what it is. You already know. You know what it is. You got to believe it. If you don't do something with it, you didn't believe it. You say you did. You say you believed it. You didn't believe it. You show me what you believe by what you say. I'll show you what you believe by what you do. That's what the book says. How do you make Jesus the Lord of your life? Is Jesus the Lord of your life if the Word of God is not the Lord of your life? And if you don't know what the Word says, pretty hard to make Him Lord because you don't know what the world's coming at you if you don't know what the word says about it. When I first read Romans chapter 13, verse 8, it said, Oh, no man, anything except to love him. I thought, That's the dumbest thing I've ever read in my life. How do you do that? I'm 29 years old, and I read that, and it's like, I'm done. I'll never run a construction business. How are you going to do it without going into debt? But see, a year earlier, he showed me 1 John 2, 27. 
There's an anointing that abides in me, and I don't need any man to teach me. Just follow it. So I read it. Seems pretty simple. It's childlike. I said, I believe it. And I stepped out and did something that everybody in the universe, if they knew I was doing it, they would have not only told me I was out of my mind, but if I sucked into listening to all the garbage, I would have ended up in jail. I was building a house on somebody else's land and didn't have the money for the house. You know what? You know how many people I told? Only my wife knew because I was over there building it. Because this wasn't about me. Oh, you know, you, you know what? You can't worry about that. You, if you want to be a leader, you got to show that you're a leader. And they'll follow. I don't care how much they scream and holler and growl and climb and cr crawl and whack on you, whatever. I don't care. You got to know this is between you, the head of the house, and the Lord. Oh, my gosh. The men in my life that have just absolutely failed. They either failed by financially caving or they just never got to any place where they wanted. I have this one particular friend. He yiped and cried and bawled and squalled with the job he had forever. And, and, and he, he no more listened to what I had to say than the man in the moon. He wanted to go to church and sing. Be in business. or be, And he wanted God to prosper him. So he ended up his whole life working at a little job in a little factory in Sydney. Whined and complained, growled and moaned and groaned. You know what he did? He had a fantastic job working for a company in town that sold cigarettes and candy to all the gas stations and all the companies in town and all over the place, making a lot of money. You know what he did? He quit because he said, I don't think God wants me to sell cigarettes. Now, do you think his mind was renewed to the word of God? Do you think he was talking to a God and said, God, what should I do? He just made a decision. He said, I just don't think. I said, did you hear from God? Can you give me the chapter and verse? Well, no, but I just didn't think. See how you are? If you, if you don't have this word going on in your life when you make your decisions, you're always going to be taking the wrong pathway, and you're never going to get anywhere. Yeah, you'll have money for your kids, you know, enough money to scrape together a little 900-square-foot house and, you know, and drive a halfway decent car that you're making payments on for 13 years. Yeah, you have that. And you'll think everything's hunky-dory because all the payments are getting made and everything, but you're going nowhere and not getting any place you want to be, and you're just failing at life from your heart. Now, they won't talk about it. Because they got to a place where they think this is my lot in life because of Calvin. If what is happening in your life is happening, it must be from God because I love God and I'm born again, so this thing must be from God. You are deceived up to your eyeballs. My Bible says you should have a vision and a dream. My Bible says all things are possible to him who believes. Believes what? Your vision and your dream. My gosh, man. It's so simple. You know that weaknesses you've had all your life? You think that's just normal. It's called a familiar spirit. And he's convinced you it's normal. Maybe you go to a church that's dead or in a doornail, and you think that's normal because you've always done it. You're deceived up to your eyeballs. Demons are dancing with you, and you're dancing with them, and you guys are having a party. And guess what he's going to do? He's going to kill you on the highway on your way home. Yeah, same result. And you'll think he's your friend. 
You got familiar spirits in your life? Don't you think it's time to get rid of them? Because if you stop it and you start saying no and you start saying, I cast that thought down and I bring it into captivity, bringing every thought into obedience to the word of God. Well, how are you going to know what that is if you don't know what the word says? How are you going to bring something into obedience to the word of God if you don't know what it says? So you just live with it. And he'll let you slink into nothingness and you'll sit at home doing nothing all your life and you'll never accomplish anything in the kingdom. You'll die and go to heaven and God will love you and, he, and, you, and everything will be great, but you'll never accomplish what God really wanted you to accomplish. Man, I'm telling you right now, you guys have been born into the greatest time in the history of the universe. And all you do is go out here and live your life and eat your McDonald's twice a day and, and, and have easy life and luxury. Then you know what? You're not going to accomplish anything in the greatest time in the universe, in the, in the universe to be alive. Talk about how bad the country is and how bad that this is and how bad that that is. Well, you know why? Why would you even care? Just go to vote. Do your job. You can go around. Oh, you want to stand on the street corner uptown? Fine. I just soon get people healed. Just go do that and t talk about politics. Who cares? God's not going to let this thing go anywhere. Not till he's done with it. Till he's done with it. Not you. Him. Key is, is you need to hook up with him. Find out what he's doing. Find out what gifts you have and get you to busy using it the best way you know how. That's that vision. That's that dream. Dig deep into your heart and see what, see over your, all your working years, what kind of a dream did you have? That dream that, that, dream that you had is real. You may have suppressed it, and it may be down there in the floor somewhere, dying, but it's real. And it may not even be the one thing God wants you to do. It may be what God wants you to do is exceedingly abundantly above anything you can ask or think. Is that what the Bible says? Then the dream that you're having. Because he knows the farther you go. You know, the more money I had and the more things I accomplished in faith, the bigger my dream got. It wasn't the same dream I used to have. Changed. You're driving out in the middle of Kansas and you've never been anywhere other than in your little hometown in, the, in your little house that you live in and you're driving out in the middle of Kansas, you might probably think, unless you know, know some other way, that the whole, the whole world is like Kansas. But one day you come to Denver or you come to the Rocky Mountains or what, and all of a sudden everything you thought the world was like has changed. You got what? What'd you get? Knowledge. You had a little more knowledge. That's all. You guys ever been to Florida before? You know what kind of knowledge you gain down there? You may not even know it. But if you start talking about it with the Lord, he'll start showing you. There's a reason for that. There's nothing coincidental. He expanded your vision. You looked out on the ocean, began to believe for bigger, and all of a sudden... Your, your, your world that you live in is expanding a little bit. People say, why do you go out to the Rocky Mountains? I've been everywhere in the United States, but that's where I choose. 8,000 feet in my cabin. And I have my reasons. Does it say, whosoever shall say unto this ocean, be thou plucked up and cast his teeth, and do not doubt in his heart, but believe the things he says will come to pass, you have whatever it says? Does it say that? What does it say? Why would, why would you reckon he'd use the mountain when he's trying to get a point across instead of an ocean? When you see a mountain, 
that's saying something. That's monumental. But when you look at an ocean, it's flat. Got a few waves every now and then. No, there's nothing wrong with the ocean. God created it just like he created the mountains. But I'm saying for me, I like to see. Man, I just, it, it, I'm just, every minute I think about what, how did you do that? How did you make this happen? What, what did you have in your heart? I mean, did you use a big paintbrush when you figured all this stuff out? I mean, that, it just helps me see big things, and that's kind of what the scriptures talk about. It's big things. Cast whosoever shall say unto this mountain. And the mountain is solid. And it's, you, you can, you know, I, I go out in the mountain, I grab a rock about this big, and it about, weighs about 200 pounds, and I think Christmas. And then I look at the whole mountain range, and I'm going, bang, and this is just a small part of what all the mountains in the world Said he weighed everything out, figured everything with his finger. God's hand is eight inches from here to here. Says it in the Bible. Mine's eight foot, or eight, eight, eight foot, yeah, right. <laughs> but mine's about eight and a half inches from here to here. So I'm about the same as God. Enjoying pleasures of life are wonderful things, but you don't want to make him a god. You need to read what the Proverbs has to say about it. I could be going somewhere all the time. All the time. But I know I have a job to do and a responsibility. And 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 but we all need to be thinking about what we're doing, where we're going, how we're going to get there, and what, the, what, how does God fit into the equation? What do you want me to do? And you know what? If you don't get anything from God, just keep doing what you're doing the best way you know how and, and improve that. Get better at it. Keep getting better. and Keep getting better. Because that may be the very thing that he wants you to do to push yourself down the road to get to that why that he's got the real deal for you down there. So it may be you just keep doing this. That's why you, that's the same thing as the word. Just keep reading the word. It doesn't seem like maybe you're getting anywhere. But just keep doing it. And one day he'll speak to you. But then it's a matter of you believing it and acting on it. You have to act on it. And, and that can have fear involved. Anxiety, you can have all kinds of problems. You can have all kinds of demonic forces that come and speak to you. How are you going to pay that? What are you going to do now? Where are you going to go with that? How's that going to work? How are you going to pay for that? How are you going to fix this? Uh, where do you think that's coming from? What did I just read you? We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Are you flesh and blood? So you don't wrestle against yourself. Right? There's, there's demonic forces around you. They're, they're, they're layered in power. Principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. They're not here in Lima. They don't need to be. Probably the lower demons are getting everything done they need to do here. And let me tell you something. We get them boys kicked out, and then we'll have some more powerful ones. But guess what else we get with that? We get more things going on in Lima, more power, more authority, more, more businesses, more things happening, more godly things going on. And the more godly things come on, then the more demons you brought, draw your way. But the more you resist them, at some point they'll walk away. That's why if you have something in your life that's been a hang-up, it's a demonic spirit. And he gets his way with you all the time. And don't you think it's time to say, no, I'm done with it. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I'm done with it. And the next time he comes, and he'll come, he'll come probably, if, you, if you do it right now, he'll come within 10 minutes. He'll be back. But you still have something greater in you. 
And you can say no, and you can say no. And at some point in time, if you resist the devil, he will flee. And that will be gone. And don't let him back. Because when he comes back, he brings seven demons more. Don't let him back. That's why God says you've got to stay in the word. Once you get into this thing, you've got to stick with it. You've got to keep going, keep going, keep going. You've got to stick with it. Because you're going to have a, another demon come. And he's going to be greater than the one you just got rid of. You know why? Because you've moved to another level. And you get to another level and to another level and to another level. And you get more resistance. But those other demons, at least you're moving up. You're accomplishing more, getting more done, being trusted with more. Yeah, those demons are stronger, but it won't be any harder to get rid of them than it was to get rid of that real low-level devil. Low level devil. won't be any harder because the Holy Spirit can move a pencil and the Holy Spirit can move a mountain. That's all it is. It's just trusting in the Holy Spirit, committing yourself to it. Praying in tongues. Put on the full armor of God and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray. In the Spirit. And pretty soon those demons will stop coming at you. You know why? Because the more they come at you, the stronger they're making you. And they don't want you to get too strong. Especially now that you've been told the truth. They don't want you to know this truth. They want you to live in, in darkness in your head. Is that what we talked about? They want you to live in darkness up there. And if that's where most of these guys that come in here, they get a little light, get all excited. Three, four, or five weeks later, the devil will give them 49 reasons why they shouldn't be here. And they'll believe every single one of them. And gone. We've given a, one guy, we, we give that guy a lot of money. We've done things for him. He's never had happen to him in his whole life. Gone. Because a demon that works in his life got to him and he didn't get the word of God in his heart the way he should have and that demon began to get his way. And that was the end of it. Do we pray? Do we believe? Absolutely. I pray for everybody who's ever walked through that door. All the time. But they have free will. You can pray till the cows come home and you ain't going to make somebody do something. But if you get the devil off their back a little bit, it makes it a little easier for them to make a good decision. And you can get the devil off their back. You understand? I heard that years ago. Kenneth Hagin taught that. And he's one of the gentlemen that I have a lot of respect for over my lifetime. He says, you ain't going to make a decision for those people, but if you get the devil off their back, it makes the decision a little easier. So you got family, you start taking authority over the devil. Now you ain't going to make them do anything, but you can pray that the, according to Ephesians chapter 1, which I pray every day almost, I pray that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened, that they would know the hope of their calling. That they would know and have the light and have the answers. That's, you're just praying the word. Is that what it told you to do? I don't want to pray my intellect. I've learned a long time ago that don't take me very far. I want to pray what the Word says. I want to live what the Word says because that's God and I'm nothing. I'm one of the sons, but if I don't do what he talks us about us to do, then you got nothing. You're going to heaven. He loves you. But I don't want to do that. I don't want to just go to heaven. I know I'm going there, and it's one of the benefits. But it's not the only one. There's so many other benefits. 
He gave us his precious and magnificent promises that we might become a partaker of his divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. That's a real benefit, isn't it? Why would he have said that if all, all it is is getting born again? Precious and magnificent promises. <laughs> There's a lot of promises, and they're amazing. But we get into the kingdom, and then everything just kind of Yeah, you're, you got you know you got a house over your head and you're going to heaven, but that's my boy be at peace about that. I think of, I grew up in Delphus and a lot of you guys have been there, and I think of the little old beat up houses that I used to go by. You know, it's like most Christians are living in that little old beat up house and they walk to work and they get their money, come back home and they sit outside and drink a case of beer a night and that's kind of like most Christians they're not going anywhere they're not believing for nothing they're waiting for God to do something and God says no I'm waiting for you to do something we say well I'm waiting for God to give me some money so I can go do it I said no that's never going to happen What's going to happen is you're going to get an idea, a vision, and a dream and start working toward it and get yourself involved and start moving forward by faith and, not ha and, and make sure that you're real scared about it. And once you start doing that, God provides the provision. But it's little by little. Don't talk to me about I'm going to move the Rocky Mountains when you haven't learned how to move a boulder in your backyard. Heavenly Father, I praise you and thank you for this night. I thank you for these words. And, sir, I hope I've delivered it in a way that's pleasing to you and that will edify, encourage, exhort, and build these men up, that they be encouraged and, and exhorted to, to put on the full armor of God, that they can do battle against the devil and his wiles and his ways. Thank you, Father, for the full armor. I praise you and thank you for your power and authority that these demons recognize authority and they're afraid of us. They're afraid that we'll get to know the authority that we have. We have the power, but we've got to have the authority and know that we have it or we'll never use it. We give you praise, sir, thanksgiving, blessing and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.